Who is the most frightening serial killer in your opinion? Part 6. Please help us grow by subscribing our channel Thread Tonic. Account 1. I don't normally post on Reddit, but I created an account just to comment on this. I grew up in Florida, unfortunately. Both of my parents also spent their youth here. My dad told me a story years ago that has stuck with me to this day. Back in the early or mid-80s, my dad, who was in his very early 20s at the time, and his good friend were out driving along I-95 late one night. There was a young woman thumbing for a ride, so they pulled over and picked her up. My dad said that she seemed very distant and somewhat upset at first, but he and his friend were very friendly and made small talk with her and she seemed to lighten up a bit on the ride. She asked to be let out at the next exit and they obliged. My dad said he's 99% sure the woman they picked up was Aileen Warnos. And somehow, that little bit of humanity they showed her was enough to keep them from becoming potential victims. He also made it a point to mention that she had a really tragic backstory. That really made me think, and it's stuck with me even to this day. Account 2. I would say ear ons because he would commit a crime. Robberies, then rapes, then murders over the years watch the newspapers and listen to his cop buddies investigate the case, and then change his M.O. and or appearance in order to deliberately throw them off the trail. They said he was fat. He lost weight. He said he had long hair. He cut it. They said he only attacked people who lived in single-story homes. He immediately went for a couple sleeping on the second floor. He would steal a pair of earrings from one home and leave a single earring in the next home he broke into, in the rain gutter where it would be found months or years later, or sometimes not at all. Over all his crimes, it really seemed like he was just doing it for the joy of hurting people. There was no cool-down period after each attack. Sometimes he'd assault two or three people in one night, just because he felt like it. He just wanted to hurt people. He wanted to see how much he could hurt people and how far he could take it. They did eventually catch him, when his third cousin twice removed or whatever uploaded her DNA profile to a John Doe website and got a match to E.R. Ons's DNA from the 70s. Account 3. I'm surprised no one mentioned them. Dnipro maniacs. There were three guys in Ukraine, I believe, around 20 years old. They were killing around 15 people in absolute horrible ways, just waiting next to a road in a forest for their victims. The first victim was a 50-something-year-old grandfather who, despite having survived very nasty throat cancer, still went to work on his moped so he could feed his family. They hit him while he was driving by, took him into the woods, and attacked his head with a hammer. They even made jokes about how crazy it was that the dude was still breathing, even though a part of his brain was literally visible and his whole head face was destroyed. The worst part is they filmed this whole thing, and it is available on the internet. Just a warning, NSFL Daunt, look it up. This will change your life for the absolute worst. The craziest thing, even still, is that they came from rich families, and one kid's dad was a well-known lawyer who was friends with the president or something. He actually tried to claim that the hundreds of pictures and videos all have been edited and photoshopped to frame his son. The judge, of course, dismissed it and said the level of editing would need a multi-million dollar studio to fake it. As far as I know, they are still rotting in jail. Account 4. Randy Kraft. Very rarely mentioned in serial killer lore, but he was without a doubt one of the most evil people to ever exist. My husband's grandma worked with Randy Kraft while he was actively killing. She doesn't talk about it much, but she did say that she never suspected anything. The only thing that ever caught her off guard was that he'd put extra miles on the rental car when they had business trips, and she always wondered where he was going. Account 5. Not a serial killer, but the Cambodian genocide. Seeing those rusted, abandoned schools that used to be torture chambers. The killing fields out the countryside, in the middle of nowhere, under a red sun sky. The everyday tools used for killing. Pickaxes, hammers, etc. It feels like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or something, like a rough horror movie slaughter rather than a methodical genocide like the Holocaust. Not that other genocides don't disturb me, there's just something different about this one. Account 6. I'm First Nations in British Columbia. What disturbs me is all the women that disappear along the Highway of Tears. I don't know if it's a serial killer or systematic kidnapping for human trafficking, 
Both scenarios are terrifying. My sister went camping for a week without telling anybody. We all didn't immediately panic because she does this kind of stuff once in a while, but those thoughts, you know, they drift through your mind. Having a boogeyman out there who preys on First Nations women is scary, and we have to tell girls to look out because you never know that there is this one highway they should learn about. Account 7. Growing up in Illinois, it was John Wayne Gacy for me, just for the proximity and my age at the time. Just sticks in my head as a scary mofo. Got close to him once while training to be a correctional officer, and we went to Menard CC to shake down cells for training, and some of our class shook down death row where he was. Also was close enough to speak to Richard Speck at one point when I worked at Joliet CC, of Prison Break and Blues Brothers fame. And I drove Rolando Cruz from Joliet to Menar once. He was later freed after he was proven innocent of killing a little girl named Janine Nicurico, SP. Account 8. You said killer, but I'm going to add serial rapists, Bill Cosby. The disturbing part is how well he had his outward persona mastered. Comparing him to, say, Harvey Weinstein, who didn't have himself under control, he was a master of disguise. And the most disturbing part about it is, in each case, who knew and kept it hidden. The victims needed voices who could speak for them because they were already tormented. Account 9. I'm a true crime aficionado, and I've read about a lot of serial killers. There's one that truly disturbed me, and that was Gordon Stewart Northcott of the Wineville Murders. The book The Road Out of Hell tells the story from the perspective of the sole survivor, Sanford Clark, which was actually Gordon's nephew. That tale is a lot to unpack, but it's very well done. Account 10. The little-known John Robinson. Was a cold case for a while. Sold one his victim's babies to his family member where he forged documents convincing them it was adoption. He was Sunday school teacher, scoutmaster, but also secret online and IRL leader of a cult that raped people. He is the most disturbing to me because he's an even more polarized version of Dennis Rader, BTK, yet no one talks about him. Psychopaths aren't as scary as same people who choose to be evil even with empathy. That's the worst kind of sadism. Account 11. Dennis Nilsson. Preyed on homeless men, took them back to his house for a drink. Murdered them by strangulation, then used their bodies as a masturbation aid and sat the corpses in chairs to have conversations with or lay in bed with them. Used to store them under the floorboards in his house. Got caught disposing the bodies because he chopped them up and flushed them down the toilet, blocking the drain. When it was cleared, they found out it was human flesh and busted him. ITV have recently shown a drama about his arrest and questioning and then his early months in prison. David Tennant plays him, and he is freaky. Account 12. Russell Williams. My father was in the Canadian Armed Forces, and it was unsettling that such a monster was also a commanding officer. We weren't on the same base at the same time. Reading about what he did to Marie-France Como, who was under his command, is beyond disturbing, as well as what he did to Jessica Lloyd and his other victims. There was no precedent for it but his uniforms and medals were seized and destroyed, a symbol for the way the KF didn't just discharge him, but expelled him. Account 13. My great aunt, Juanita Hoyt. While living in New York, she killed all five of her kids while four of them were just babies. I think she had five kids. Basically, every time she had a kid, she ended up suffocating them to death at the age of two five, I think. She even tried blaming it on SIDS. Kind of disturbs me because that kind of person is in my family and mental health in my family isn't the best. Just glad my grandma and my mom love their kids. Simply look up her name and you will see everything about what she did. My grandma was requested to be interviewed about her sister Juanita, but she didn't want anything to do with the whole situation. My grandma then moved from New York to Texas with the kids he had at the time. Account 14. Moses Sithole, serial rapist murderer, 38 confirmed, 76 possible, in about the span of a year, currently serving 2,110 years imprisonment. Sithole targeted black women between the ages of 18 and 45 years old. Most of his victims were being interviewed for positions with Sithole's ersatz charity. Sithole would take them to remote fields where he would beat, rape, and murder them. They were generally strangled with their own underwear. He once inflicted a head wound on the two-year-old son of one of his victims and left him to die from exposure. 
Account 15. Rodney Alcala. He would strangle his victims and then resuscitate them before raping them. Roughly 130 women were believed to be murdered by him. And right in the middle of his spree, he was a contestant on the dating game TV show. Watching it with hindsight is creepy.